Welcome back to Design Club, a show in which we analyze the design of a particular game level or mechanic. And this time we're diving deep. We thought it'd be fun to do something similar to what James does when he gives design workshops for developers. So for the next five days, we're gonna pick apart the first floor of the Durlag's Tower Dungeon from Baldur's Gate. Yep, just the first level. We're gonna go room by room and look at exactly how every piece fits together to create the player experience. Why do five entire episodes just for one dungeon floor, you might ask? Well, because to this day, Durlag's Tower stands as one of the finest examples of dungeon design in all of gaming. This medium may have changed a great deal since 1999, but the design principles used here are timeless. Whether you're building dungeons for a 2D game or a 3D game, a modern RPG or a retro throwback, but we can't just jump right into the first floor of the dungeon below Durlag's Tower just like that. No, 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 no. First, we gotta talk about how you get to Durlag's Tower. Because where a dungeon is located and how you're guided to it is a big part of how we experience the dungeon itself. First, let's look at where Durlag's Tower is located in the world of Baldur's Gate, right over here. Now, this is important because Durlag's Tower is part of an expansion, and while most of the expansion content is way off on the other side of the map, the designers made a conscious choice to place this tower pretty solidly between your starting location and two of your first main objectives. And because of the way zones are linked in Baldur's Gate, you're pretty likely to stumble upon it early in the game. This is important for two reasons. First, because the way in which the player discovers a dungeon affects their experience of it. Now, a lot of games would probably give the player a quest or an objective to guide them to the dungeon, and that's a perfectly fine approach, but maybe not the best one. Hand-holding the player right to the front door doesn't exactly create a sense of wonder. Instead, if the player can be made to stumble upon it on their own so that they have this moment of finding something unexpected and incredible in your world, or if they can be made to feel like they've discovered this mysterious place by piecing together vague hints and clues, the mere discovery of the place will be a much more powerful experience. The trick is to design in such a way that almost 100% of your players will stumble across your dungeon without the hand-holding. That's why Durlag's Tower is placed here. The second thing you'll note about the placement is that since the player is likely to discover this place early on, they'll be pretty low level when they do. Now, the dungeon itself is actually one of the most challenging locations in the entire game, and at first blush, it might seem like it would make a bit more sense to put the tower maybe over here near the other late game content. But as an experience, that would feel a little gamey. The world feels a bit more holistic if there are difficult areas scattered all around the world rather than all clumped in one location. Additionally, placing Durlag's tower near early game locations makes the tower aspirational. You discover it and it seems pretty cool, and you try going in and you probably get totally wrecked, and you think to yourself, hmm, I bet there's some cool stuff in there. I can't wait to come back and thrash this place later. And when you do come back five levels stronger, it feels just great taking down enemies that were terrifying threats a few levels ago. Imagine if you hadn't discovered this place until later in the game when you were already strong enough to tackle it. These guys would just feel like normal enemies then. Now, of course, the reason that most games don't do this is because having the player die to something they had no idea they weren't ready for often feels unfair, like the game is cheating. This begs the question, why doesn't it feel unfair when Durlag's Tower does it? Well, to answer that, let's jump to the map entrance. Immediately upon entering the zone, you meet this guy right here, and pretty much all of his dialogue tells you that this place is bad news. Notice how this guy also happens to serve as a merchant. There's a reason for that. For any lengthy dungeon, especially if your game limits the amount of stuff the player can carry, it's essential to find a way to give the player easy access to a shopkeep. This will radically reduce the amount of time spent fiddling with the inventory, and radically increase the time spent actually playing the dungeon. And actually playing the dungeon is what everybody wants, player and designer alike. Next, we have what I call an anticipation space. The player has just been warned by that friendly merchant, don't go this way or you'll die, but then nothing. This builds the tension, and then bam, the bouncers of Durlag's tower show up. You know those, you must be this tall to ride signs? These guys are that. In fact, these two enemies are far more difficult than what you're initially gonna encounter in the tower itself. Now, this is the opposite of how we usually build a game's difficulty curve, but it's actually a perfect choice in this specific case. Because if you're gonna put a challenging area in a low-level section of your game, it's super important that you prevent the player from spending hours frustratedly trying to beat a challenge that's simply impossible for them. These two incredibly difficult enemies act as gatekeepers. By putting them out front, the designers know that if the player gets past these guys, whatever level the player might be, they're ready. They are skilled enough to enjoy the rest of the dungeon. After these gatekeepers, we have a long, narrow, seemingly empty path with nothing at all. 
At first, this might seem like wasted space, but it too has a purpose. See, the designers know that some clever players are gonna try to attempt to just run past those gatekeeper monsters instead of fighting them. And that would be a problem because, like I said earlier, it's super important that the designers know with absolute certainty that the player can actually defeat the gatekeepers before they take on the tower. So this space is designed to trap the player and make sure that even with Baldur's Gate's clunky pathfinding, the enemies have ample time to kill most of the player's party if they try to just run past. Now note that there actually is one trivial enemy along this path, right here. This enemy's not meant to be a challenge. He's here simply to run interference, to slow down any underleveled players who might be trying to run past the gatekeepers. Also, note the enemy type. It's a doppelganger. Even with this throwaway enemy, the designers didn't miss an opportunity to do a little foreshadowing. The entire design of the outside of the tower functions as one big gate. If you can get past all this, you're ready. Now I should note that there is one minor quest in the game that's meant to lead you right to the tower if you're one of the players who bought the expansion after you already beat most of the game, but it's clear that the designers were anticipating that many future players would stumble on the tower in the course of normal play, so I'm just gonna move along. Just note that even though they tried to make sure that 80 plus percent of their players would find Durlag's tower on their own, they did include a minor hand-holding quest well after the point in the game that players should have found the tower, just to make sure that the other 20% of players didn't miss out. And now, at last, we reach the tower itself. From here, we can go either up or down. And if I had infinite time to make these, I'd talk about the upper levels of Duralag's tower and how they're used to build the player's curiosity about just what happened in this strange tower and why the place now lies abandoned. But there is just so much design to dig into in the dungeon's lower levels, I'm just gonna dive right in. Join us next time as we get to the real meat of Durlag's tower and discuss how encounters are built, how traps are placed, and how treasure is stored. See you next time.